Welcome to the Global News Podcast, your source for the latest and most comprehensive coverage of global events, breaking news, and in-depth analysis. We are here to guide you through the top stories from around the world. Whether it's politics, economics, culture, or science. Service. Listen and subscribe wherever you get your BBC podcasts. This is the Global News Podcast from the BBC World Service. I'm Paul Moss, and in the early hours of Wednesday the 3rd of April, these are our main stories. They came to Gaza to help feed people. This is the beautiful, fragrant, aromatic rice that will be served today from Dinabala Kitchen. The killing of seven foreign aid workers by Israeli forces prompts widespread condemnation. But will that change anything? Ukraine strikes deep inside Russia, targeting an oil refinery and a factory making drones. And the British director, Alex Garland, talks to the BBC about his latest film, Civil War. This film is about journalists and it's about polarisation, populist politics and polarisation, which leads to extremism and extremist thinking. That's happening in America, but it's happening in this country. Also in this podcast, at a theatre in Paris, much ado about a washing machine. At the end of the play, some people started to insult each other inside the theatre. They almost started to fight physically. Plus, why are there now a record-breaking number of billionaires? There's been widespread condemnation of an Israeli strike which killed seven aid workers in Gaza. Among the dead was an American with dual citizenship, a Pole, an Australian and three British citizens. The US was just one among many international voices to express its outrage, demanding Israel do more to protect those providing support for Gaza's Palestinians. The British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak spoke directly to his Israeli counterpart Benjamin Netanyahu, calling for a thorough and transparent independent investigation. More details have already emerged about exactly how the attack happened. We now know that three vehicles were hit, apparently while they were some distance apart. Now that's important because if true, it would suggest each of them was individually targeted. From Jerusalem, here's our correspondent, Hugo Bachega. The World Central Kitchen team was travelling at night in a clearly marked convoy of three cars on a coastal road in central Gaza. The organization said the group had left a warehouse after unloading a hundred tons of humanitarian aid and that its movements had been coordinated with the Israeli military. The three cars were struck separately by the Israeli military for reasons that are still not clear. Seven workers were killed, including three British nationals. They've been named as John Chapman, James Henderson and James Kirby. Citizens from Australia, Poland and the United States were also killed. One of them, Lozomi Frankom from Australia, had posted this video on social media last month. Hey, this is Zomi and Chef Olivier. We're at the Jira Balaf kitchen um, and we've got the mise en place. This is the, the beautiful, fragrant, aromatic rice that will be served today from Jira Balaf kitchen. Thank you. World Central Kitchen is one of the main organizations operating in Gaza. Its CEO, Erin Gore, said this had been a targeted attack by the Israeli military, calling it unforgivable. The group has announced it is suspending its activities in the region. The Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said this was a tragic incident, but unintentional. It happens in war, he said. But the airstrike has sparked disbelief and anger among other aid organizations and countries whose citizens were among the dead. In a call with Mr. Netanyahu, Rishi Sunak said he was appalled by the incident and described the situation in Gaza as increasingly intolerable. The U.S. Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, paid tribute to the victims and called for accountability. These people are heroes. We shouldn't have a situation where people who are simply trying to help their fellow human beings are themselves at grave risk. Uh, we've spoken directly to the Israeli government about this particular incident. We've urged a swift, a thorough, an impartial investigation. 
The incident will add more pressure on Israel over the way it is conducting its war against Hamas in Gaza, where more than 32,000 Palestinians have been killed and a humanitarian crisis only gets worse. Hugo Bachega in Jerusalem. The deaths of those aid workers may be tragic, but as we heard there, the fact is that Israel's war on Gaza has killed more than 30,000 people, according to the authorities there, most of them civilians. And even more could die if famine takes hold, as many agencies are warning could happen. So this is just about the worst time for the people supplying food to Gaza to halt their operations. Yet that is what some have said they're doing in the wake of the latest killings. Matthew Hollingworth from the World Food Programme says change is urgently needed. Humanitarians should be protected, respected. We should have access to reach everywhere we need to reach. We should be able to work and notify and coordinate in the fastest means possible and have real-time feedback from the IDF and other actors in the conflict so that we can move about safely and do our jobs. We are there to save lives. So it's not only about an investigation, we need change. There is a long-standing system by which the Israeli military are kept informed of aid workers' movements, precisely so that they don't end up killing people who only came to Gaza to help save lives. Our world affairs correspondent Paul Adams told me how this system is supposed to work. It involves essentially something very simple, which is making sure the warring parties know where you are, where you're going, when you're going, what vehicles you're driving in. And even though that sounds simple, aid agency people who I've spoken to say that it's incredibly time consuming. You have to be on the phone constantly to let the Israelis know where you are and where you're moving next. And clearly, as we've seen, it is not infallible. Yes, because we've heard that uh, aid agencies have complained for a long time before this incident that uh, their personnel were not necessarily being protected the way they should be. That's right. There is quite a long list now of episodes when one agency or another has complained that their headquarters or their personnel have been targeted. There was a case back in early February in which a UN convoy Interestingly, carrying food from the very same organisation, the World Central Kitchen, was targeted by naval gunfire on the coast road. And that led to the complete suspension of UN convoys to the north for a period of time. And so there is a feeling that this system is not working the way it should. One official told me he didn't want to be named that the part of the Israeli military that people communicate with is not, if you like, relaying the message adequately so that the people who pass on the message to those flying aircraft, manning tanks, checkpoints and all the rest of it. Somebody is coming along the road who should not be targeted. Somehow there's a breakdown and it has happened more than once. Of course, we've seen apologies for this accident, uh, this unintended act, but there are some who are suggesting it may not be entirely accidental that these aid convoys are being hit. Well, if you work for the UN or some of the other aid agencies on the ground and you've experienced everything they've experienced over the past five months, you could be forgiven for feeling that somehow Israel does not want aid to be distributed, especially to northern Gaza, where Israel continues to conduct uh, military operations. Now, we have no way of uh, verifying that, but it is clear that there have been enough episodes to make people wonder, is this just bad luck? Is this bad organisation? Are these trigger-happy pilots or tank crews or whatever? Or is there something else going on? Clearly, the Israelis are taking this pretty seriously. Israel has been criticised for months now about its apparent unwillingness to look after the the interests of the civilian population of the Gaza Strip. It knows that it needs to be seen to be doing a better job of that. And so it is possible that we will see uh, the whole process overhauled and examined because I think we are reaching a point at which many of Israel's closest friends are thinking this just cannot go on. Paul Adams. Tatarstan is one of the smaller republics within Russia, and a relatively remote one, sitting almost a thousand kilometres east of Moscow. So it was quite a military achievement for Ukraine when it managed to strike a drone factory there using one of its own drones. But Tatarstan is most well known as a producer of oil, and it seems that Ukraine also hit a refinery there. From Ukraine, here's our correspondent Sarah Rainsford. This was the moment when horrified Russians watched a large drone, shaped like a light aircraft, careering into a building. There's an explosion, then a ball of flames on impact. 
Ukraine's military intelligence service says it carried out the attack, the deepest it's ever struck inside Russia. It says it caused significant damage at a facility producing long-range drones. Officials in Russia say an accommodation block was hit. Ukraine targeted a major oil refinery overnight too, although Russia says its jamming devices locked on to that drone before it hit, and production continues. The latest attacks show Ukraine's expanding capacity in drone warfare. It is increasingly important as its Western allies stall on supplying ammunition for the front lines and shy away from providing long-range missiles. Volodymyr Zelensky says Ukraine is stepping up its own production, including of far-reaching drones for what he called special tasks. Ukraine has been using them to target sites much further from its border this year, hitting energy facilities that it argues Russia uses to fuel and to fund its military operations. Sarah Rainsford. Now, from a real war to a fictional one. Sort of. The American actress Kirsten Dunst says her new film Civil War is intended as a warning about how a domestic conflict could break out in the US one day. It features a president, who some have compared to Donald Trump, and it includes footage of riots and more large-scale fighting. The film was written and directed by Alex Garland, famous for coming out with other dystopian hits, such as 28 Days Later and Ex Machina. He spoke to Charlotte Gallagher, along with Kirsten Dunst, about their film and about men getting paid more in Hollywood. The United States Army ramps up activity. The White House issued warnings to the Western forces as well as the Florida Alliance. Civil war is about an America divided, engulfed by violence, and led by a president who's refusing to leave the White House and has torn up the Constitution. Kirsten Dunst plays a war photographer, traumatised by her work. I think the movie is very much so a warning. And it leaves people with so much to think about. If you're in the theatre and you really take it in, it's a very moving piece about journalists. And you don't really get that look inside in the way that Alex filmed this movie. Felt very realistic while watching the film. Mr. President, do you regret the use of airstrikes against American citizens? People have drawn parallels with current politics in America and the January 6th insurrection that brought chaos to Washington, D.C., But Alex Garland says it's not just relevant to the US. The film is set in America. This film is about journalists, politics and polarisation, which leads to extremism and extremist thinking. That's happening in America, but it's happening happening here for a long time. And it's happening across Europe. I could list the countries, or you could list the countries, where that would be true. They shoot journalists on sight in the capital. Every instinct in me says this is death. The reporters in this film face immediate dangers to their life, but Alex says it's also a commentary on the dangers facing journalism as a whole. Journalism is under attack because you get people saying, do not trust the BBC, and you will be in places where you would be attacked and criticised, as you know, for saying the unbiased news reporting organisation that you belong to. For me, at my age, there's something very strange about that. It's not just strange it's scary and it's dangerous he saved my life twice and i've never even seen his face kirsten has been acting since she was a child and as a teenager starred in some of the biggest films of the era like spider-man jumanji and bring it on she has stardom but she didn't have pay equality i definitely grew up in a time with major pay disparity between the lead actor and myself even though i had been in bring it on and he hadn't. And did you feel in that time you were in a position that you couldn't say, hang on a second, why is this person being paid more than I, I was very young and I was 17. I, you know, when you're that age, I'm still learning my taste in film. I didn't even think to ask. She's a terrible queen. Letting everyone down would be my greatest unhappiness. Marie Antoinette was another of Kirsten's lavish, big budget films, but wasn't welcomed by the critics. The people that were watching that movie were my age. They weren't movie reviewers. Movie reviewers were old men. The people that enjoy Marie Antoinette have now grown up and they're like, we loved this movie, but they weren't the people that were writing reviews. We grow up in a world where it's mankind, man-made, man this, man that. That's how we grew up. I think that times have changed. Hopefully the way I carve my path will help other, you know, actresses. Kirsten Dunn sending that report by Charlotte Gallagher. 
The first man on the moon is Old Hat. Since then, we've had the first lunar vehicle, along with a variety of automatic probes, some of which landed successfully, others less so. But now NASA has unveiled plans to grow the first crops on the moon. The project is called Lunar Effects on Agricultural Flora, or LEAF. The crops will be grown for food, for cleaning air, and purifying water. Martha Carney has been finding out how from Christine Escobar, who holds the post of Space Habitat Systems Engineer. The LEAF experiment is essentially a growth chamber, much like you would have an indoor farm on Earth that provides the plants with everything that they need to live. But the challenge with this growth chamber, and especially on the surface of the moon, is that the instrument must also protect them from the harsh conditions of space, as well as be able to operate in reduced gravity. So what we hope to learn is about how the plants grow, how they photosynthesize, how the lunar environment might affect their color and shape, and really how they respond to stress in the environment that is found on the moon. Things like elevated radiation and reduced gravity and extreme temperatures. And have you decided what kinds of crops that you might be looking at? Yes, so we're really excited. We've chosen three different varieties. Uh, one is called wolfia, but you might know it as duckweed or water lentils. Uh, another crop is called brassica rapa, which are plants that are similar or related to turnips. And a third crop is called arabidopsis or thalecress. And they have been studied before in space. So we have a lot of data to compare to, um, not on the moon, of course, but in, in Earth orbit, uh, these plants have been grown. But also two of them are really nutritious and edible. So they're really representative of potential space crops that one might eat. Do you think the astronauts are going to be quite as excited about the prospect of eating lots of duckweed? Oh, <laughs> I think the astronauts are going to be quite excited about the prospect of eating any uh, plants and fresh food in, in, in general. Fresh food is always very welcome for an astronaut uh, crew as a break from the mundane diet of, of dehydrated uh, prepackaged meals. If that's the yes. choice, I can understand so, that. But are a little interesting because it's not something we're very familiar with as a standard food or vegetable that we might eat, but they're actually really commonly eaten in Asian countries and actually uh, tasty and just incredibly nutritious. So we see these plants as a potential supplement, like maybe on a salad or in a soup. Christine Escobar talking there to Martha Carney. Still to come on the Global News Podcast... How is it possible that a 12-year-old could get hold of a gun? And how is it possible that he ended up in a classroom with a gun? Finland is in shock following a school shooting by a child that left one pupil dead and several wounded. It's not often we report on a phone call having taken place. But this one did last an hour and 45 minutes, and it was a call between the US President Joe Biden and his Chinese opposite number, Xi Jinping. It came just as people have suggested there could be a thaw in relations between the two countries, although they remain bitterly divided on trade and on China's stated intention to reunify with Taiwan by force if necessary. From Washington, here's our State Department correspondent, Tom Bateman. The phone call lasted an hour and 45 minutes, with the US and China trying to re-establish channels of communication after ties sank to their lowest levels in decades in recent years. With regional tensions rising, the White House says President Biden emphasised the need to maintain stability in the Taiwan Strait and the South China Sea, a nod to the fact that Washington has pledged to defend allies who feel threatened by an increasingly assertive China. On trade relations, President Xi warned Mr Biden the US was not not de-risking but creating risks by suppressing Beijing's technology development and adding new entities to the sanctions list. Chinese state media said President Xi told Mr Biden that ties were beginning to stabilise but warned that they could slide into conflict or confrontation. Both sides have reasons now to pursue more dialogue and try to avert friction but the long-term relations between these two rival but interdependent powers is still set to shape global relations for the coming decades. Tom Bateman. There had been warnings across Finland in recent years. Schools have received a growing number of threats that shootings were going to take place. 
that actual shootings are still rare, which means it came as a shock when a 12-year-old child was killed after one of his classmates opened fire. Two others were seriously injured. Ayan Hanifa, pupil at the school, described what happened. When I was in the class, we were given permission to go out, but then suddenly the teacher said us to like、um, come back to the class, and then we like got the instructions to sit and do everything like the emergency things. I think I heard one or two gunshots, but I'm not sure. It's a little traumatizing. The police investigation is still ongoing, but for the latest details, I spoke to our reporter in Finland, Erika Benke. We know that the suspect, the twelve-year-old boy, ran away from the scene after the shooting, and police detained him only about three kilometers away from the school. He still had the handgun in his possession, but he calmly handed it over to the policeman who found him. Politicians say the entire country is in shock and in mourning. Of course, people are so shocked because because of the age of the victims and the suspected shooter. So they are all twelve years old. It seems that this boy took a weapon from some member of his family. Finland's a country with very lax laws about guns. I mean, it's quite easy to own one, isn't it? Well, gun laws were actually tightened in 2010 after two previous cases of school shootings that similarly shocked the nation in 2007 and 2008. There are a lot of guns around, but to own one, you need to have a license and a number of background checks that the police will do. They obviously check your criminal record. You have to be 18, which is probably a little younger than in many other countries, and even 15-year-olds can acquire a license to use somebody else's gun. So one one reason for that is that hunting is very popular here, and also target shooting, sports shooting, is is quite popular. It's ironic, isn't it, that just a short while ago the Finnish government, I think, was calling for there to be more gun ownership, more training, certainly for people on how to use guns, because of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Exactly. So there was a call just a few weeks ago by the Finnish government to increase the number of shooting ranges in Finland to boost interest in national defence. Despite that effort, do you think this latest incident could lead to calls for tighter laws on on gun ownership? Yeah, so that was the question that reporters at today's press conference were asking: How is it possible that a twelve-year-old could get hold of a gun, and how is it possible that he ended up in a classroom with a gun? Prime Minister Petteri Orpo already today was talking about the need to look at increased or improved healthcare services for children. Erika Benke in Finland. A large trial has started here in the UK to try and understand whether taking antidepressants following a brain injury could prevent severe depression, which can happen after a blow to the brain, even if it's mild. The lead researcher, Professor Khalida Ismail from King's College London, explained to Nuala McGovern why the study was so important. Depression is already common in the general population. It's about five percent, and in people who've had a head injury, even those who've had a smaller head injury, the rates increase to fifty percent. Fifty. That's right. It's a very large, tenfold increased risk. So it seems to make sense for the NHS and for the person who has the head injury to try and prevent the depression and other related symptoms from happening in the first place. So, with the trial, what are you planning on doing? So this trial is what we call technically a large randomised control trial. There's an equal chance, dictated by the computer, of being allocated to the experimental treatment, which is an antidepressant called sertraline, or an inactive placebo. They look identical to each other. The patients are randomised to one of those two groups, and they are being asked to take this medication for twelve months as soon after the head injury has taken place. So you'd be looking for volunteers for this. That's right. We are inviting patients presenting in A and E or have just been admitted to a trauma ward with a head injury to ask them if they're interested in participating in order to test if we can actually prevent depression from happening in the first place. Why would depression happen at such a potentially high rate、mm. after a head collision? Because there's been trauma to the brain,、mm. and the brain is where depression happens. There has been a biological insult to brain cells. We don't fully know 
exactly the mechanisms because this is still a very new area of research in terms of understanding biologically why people get depression. But the theory is there is probably some activation of inflammation as a result of the head injury in the brain and that this then disrupts the normal pathways that control our mood. It's so interesting that mm. you're talking about it as a biological insult yeah. as opposed to, I suppose, some people might think of depression as sometimes outward environmental yes. factors grief, um, traumatic life event, as opposed to an actual traumatic knock to the brain. Well, exactly. And perhaps that explains why there's such a massive increase in the risk of depression from 5% to the general public to 50% in people with head injury. And although we can't always see all the damage on the head scans, it may be that they've been very small micro tears, for instance, Mm -hmm. that may be contributing to activating the inflammation. Do you think people who have had a traumatic brain injury and their loved ones know about the potential for depression after the collision? No, it's not very well explained to patients. It might be by chance. I remember there's one patient we were talking to as part of our preparation and he had gone into a coma following a very severe road traffic accident and he had said that if somebody had told me that an antidepressant would have helped my rehabilitation when I woke up I would have wanted the nurses and doctors to have given it to me in my tubes Wow! so that I had the best chance when I woke up and that really struck in my mind as the reason why this study is important. Professor Khalida Ismail from King's College London speaking to Nuala McGovern. The French actress Isabelle Huppert has played some pretty severe characters in her time. A psychopathic piano teacher, a murderous servant and a vengeful widow, among others. Now she's been similarly cast in a new French production of the play Berenice, taking the role of a queen furious when her lover chooses to marry someone else. Now, given what would seem to be this rather tough image... It must have taken some nerve for members of the audience to start heckling the French star. But they did have a reason, as Stephanie Prentice explains. When the multi-award-winning actress Isabelle Huppert appears on stage, fans tend to get excited, expecting intrigue, passion and drama. But usually from the performance, not the audience. That's all changed in Paris during a retelling of Berenice, a five-act tragedy by the great 17th-century dramatist Racine. The theatre was fully booked and director Romeo Castellucci's pared-down production, if a little unusual, well-received. But things took a turn when a washing machine was wheeled onto the stage. It caused some confusion, particularly when Ms. Huppert spoke to it but not as much as the latter half of the performance, which has been described by some as intentionally provocative. Alban Barthélemy is a journalist at the French newspaper Le Figaro and was there. Suddenly, after like one hour of playing, Isabelle Huppert starts stuttering on stage. Well, again, uh, it was supposed to be tragic, I guess, but then a man in the audience, just in front of me actually, starts yelling at her. He said, uh, we do not understand what you're saying, Isabel. And a couple of minutes later, another guy 